Good day everyone, this is Mr. T and today we begin our journey into Unit 3 Topic 1 of Psychology with the Human Nervous System. Okay, confession, when I was younger I actually used to think this was the system that activated when you were nervous, but really it's more accurate to think of it as the nervous system. So we're going to be looking at these three objectives in today's video and you'll notice that two out of three start with the word recall and that's because many of these were already covered in Unit 1 Topic 2 of QC Psychology. Let's go through the key things we need to know now in unit three, topic one. So the nervous system can be broken up into essentially these two parts, the central nervous system, the stuff in pink, and the peripheral. The central is essentially the brain and the spinal cord. And we wanna be careful not to confuse it with the spine, which is the protective bony structure. See, the spinal cord runs from the base of the brain through the spine to each part of the body. It's essentially the body's cable management, like this sleeve over here. Although perhaps more accurately, this guy with like exits along the way. And there's two-way communication, of course, because the brain both needs to receive sensory input as well as give out motor input. Uh, next up, the peripheral nervous system is essentially everything else, all the bits here in yellow. You'll notice that we defined both parts of the nervous system here physically. That is, one was in the center and one was on the periphery. But also, we can define these parts by function. So one part receives input, the pink, and the other sends information to the center. And this is helpful because it can get a bit confusing from here. As this diagram from osmosis shows, trying to understand the nervous system further results in more divisions that can get quite confusing. Now, in unit three, we just need to know in particular these two, the somatic and the autonomic. So the somatic part of the PNS essentially looks after voluntary movement of all our muscles, but all the involuntary movement, so non-skeletal muscles like your heart beating, that's gonna be the autonomic nervous system. Interestingly, there are a couple of things we do like breathing and blinking that can actually be controlled by both because we do those things automatically when we're not thinking about it. But if you do think about it, you can actually control your breathing and your blinking. And as you may already know, the autonomic branch of the peripheral nervous system can be further divided into the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. All wonderful stuff from unit one that thankfully is not here in unit three. Okay, time to jump back to the brain. It's really quite incredible to think that this squishy mass of cells is responsible for literally all of civilization. Now, just like before, we can try and understand the brain physically, so what the different compartments actually are, or functionally what each of the regions seem to do. In unit one, the focus was more on the general section, so the hindbrain, the forebrain, and the midbrain, but now in unit three, we're focusing on the lobes of the cortex. The cortex is the outer part of the brain, which makes up the majority of the organ by mass. It's basically all you see if you look at the brain from the outside. Scientists have traditionally divided the cerebral cortex into four different lobes. There's the frontal lobe over here, the parietal lobe, the green bit over here, the temporal lobe, which is just here, and the occipital lobe, this little blue guy at the back. Of course, these four lobes are mirrored on the left and right hemispheres of the brain, so I guess you could say there are eight lobes in the brain. And we think these lobes do things like these. So the frontal lobe is where more abstract thought occurs. The parietal lobe is where you have touch and nonverbal thoughts, spatial orientation, hearing and language here in the temporal lobe, and then very much vision, what we see in the occipital lobe. Here's another diagram that says very similar things. Now, when we say that hearing occurs here or vision occurs here, it's better to say it's like the primary visual cortex because because although it's the main region responsible for that function, it isn't the only one. But of course, this doesn't capture everything. I mean, how about the part of the brain that makes me gag at the smell of raw fish, or the part that replays Taylor Swift 24 seven, even when I don't want it to. The brain is obviously far more complex than this, but this does provide a helpful starting point. It's sort of like dividing Australia into its main states and territories. And then from there, we can get further into each part and discover more. Let's now have a look at some specific functional parts of the brain, the language centers. So in Unit one, we looked at these three sections of the brain and we need to know it here again in unit three. So here's a refresher. Broca's area was named after Pierre Broca who had two patients with similar symptoms. One could only ever say the word tan repetitively while the other only had five words in his entire vocabulary. We would describe both men as having aphasia which is a language disorder. And after they died, it was found that they both had brain damage in the exact same spot, right here in the left frontal lobe, 
which became known as Broca's area. Broca's findings initially received some criticism because the idea of a single area of the brain being responsible for certain behaviors had not yet been accepted. However, further support for Broca came just 12 years later because in 1873, inspired by the research of Broca, German physician Wernicke studied patients who were able to produce fluent speech, but that made no sense. They also didn't seem able to comprehend language. And would you believe it, these patients were found later to have brain damage at another specific spot located right here in the left temporal lobe, which of course became known as Wernicke's area. We now know a lot more about what those areas of the brain are responsible for. Broca's area is now thought to be the speech production region of the brain. It literally controls lips, tongue, vocal cord movement to produce words coming out of our mouths. Meanwhile, Wernicke's area is primarily responsible for comprehension, but also the production of grammatically correct speech. And that's because there is a little bit of overlap. Broca's area has more recently been shown to also assist in comprehension, but generally speaking, these labels hold true. So when Broca's area was damaged, we had people who could comprehend language, but could really produce words. And when Wernicke's area was damaged, we had people who couldn't understand speech and may have spoken fluently, but their words didn't make sense. Now, it's very important to say here that Broca's area is not the same as Broca's aphasia. Do not mix the two terms up. If an exam question asks what Wernicke area does, for example, and you answer by saying that affected people speak with word salad, you haven't actually answered the question. This is very important. Now, more recently, a third area of the brain important for language has been identified. British scientists discovered that the inferior parietal lobe actually provides a connection between Broca's area and Wernicke's area via a bundle of nerve fibers. They named this area Gershwin's territory after the famous American neurologist who theorized that there might be such a connection. So we can think of Gershwin's territory as doing a lot of linking, linking the words we read or hear to areas of the brain responsible for producing speech. Like I said before, it's essentially a bundle of nerve fibers that connects Broca's and Wernicke's areas, but perhaps more functionally rather than physically. We think that it allows simultaneous processing of auditory and visual stimuli because it contains nerves that are multimodal. Neurons that can do a variety of things. And so that allows us to process the properties of words, how they look, how they sound, and altogether help us make meaning of language. All right, this video lesson covered many objectives that overlap with unit one. So make sure you understand what's important here in unit three. Thanks, and I'll see you in the next video.